Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Keith Bybee. I direct the Institute for the Study of Judiciary Politics and the Media here at Syracuse University. Uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the seventh lecture in our Law, Politics, and Media speaker series uh, this semester. Uh, this speaker series uh, invites um, academics, practitioners from the bench, the bar, the world of policymaking to address issues at the intersection of law, politics, and the media. The speaker series is co-sponsored by IJPM and the Tully Center for Free Speech, which is directed by a man who's known by many names here on campus. Uh, some call him the Baron. I've heard him called Professor Sparkle Pants. But I just call him Boom Boom Roy Gutterman, <laughs> sitting right there. Today, we are fortunate enough to have Professor Bob Thompson, who is the uh, trustee professor of television and popular culture at Newhouse. He also directs the uh, Blyer Center for Popular Culture, Television and Popular Culture uh, at Newhouse. Uh, he's been called by the Associated Press the ambassador, pop culture ambassador. Um, and I think that's a reference to the fact that uh, he knows all things about television and pop culture, which is an extremely broad field. Um, and I, I, I'm not being, uh, I'm not just uh, uh, blowing sunshine his way when I says he knows all things. He does know all things, uh, as you will hear today. The title of his lecture is Law and Popular Culture. The focus of his lecture will be on indecency uh, and um, broadcast media. Um, for those of you who are new to the lecture today, let me just say a few things about how we proceed. Uh, Professor Thompson will speak for about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll have Q&A. If you have a question, uh, please press the button on the dome in front of you. Those are microphones. The red light will switch to green, and we'll be able to pick up your voice for the video. At 5 o'clock in this room, we will have a reception, and I invite everybody to stay. We'll be bringing food and drink right into the room. So if you can stick around for continued conversation, that would be great. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Bob Thompson. Ah, thank you. I still, you know, now that this has started, I still for the life of me don't know how I got invited to, uh, uh, to speak at this group. I, I read the poster of all these uh, uh, people, uh, and as you say, from the bench and from the bar. I've been to a bar, I've sat on a bench, but uh, that's about <laughs> the extent of it. I really feel like... Um, uh, this week, like Sarah Palin, have you heard she's getting a Judge Judy uh, type of show? Um, and there's been, I think, about 70 of those, but it, they've always been people who actually were once judges or at least had uh, practiced law. And she has done neither of the, those, nor has she ever been to law school. Um, yet she's going to be on this uh, uh, thing and, and might be on the Supreme Court if we don't watch out. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, I, 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 I come to you in touch with my inner Sarah uh, today. And I'm not going to be talking so much about that. I didn't title, by the way, Law and Pop Culture, though. I'd like to hear that lecture. That would take a little more than 35 minutes. Um, but uh, uh, I want to uh, come to talk today about a place where I think in most people's minds, uh, the, the law and what they consume intersects. And that's, of course, the whole issue of the little slice of stuff that, is pros that there are rules about in what we, um, uh, in what we see. And you guys are lucky because you grew up in an era where you had both basic cable and premium cable, which allowed to use the full palette of the American language, which is allowed to talk about about PP and poo poo and SEX uh, every once in a while. Um, whereas for uh, decades, over half a century in American broadcasting, uh, there was this huge period where so much stuff just wasn't done. And it wasn't just the uh, uh, F FCC, which gets named that uh, from the FRC in 1934, I think it is. Um, it was other elements uh, as well, but I wanted to kind of talk about those. But first of all, uh, I'm playing from network radio. This is back in the 30s, 1937, when radio was the dominant entertainment form in the uh, country. People listened to more radio than went to movies. There was no television. There were soap operas, comedies, sitcoms, dramas, doctor shows, reality shows, and all the rest of it. And uh, uh, what I'm about to play is just a small clip from a sketch on a show called The Chase and Sanborn Hour, named after Chase and Sanborn Coffee, which was its sponsor. And it stars, um, uh, its guest star was Mae West. And uh, um, Mae West was this really kind of uh, sultry, uh, buxom, uh, 
sex symbol, as they were called uh, at the time. And no matter what she said, it sounded dirty. She could ask you if you'd, if you'd want a, if a cup of coffee, and you would, you would blush, and then she'd say, and how'd you like some cream in that? And then you'd really, you know, whatever. Anyway, she made stuff sound really dirty. She uh, uh, came on as a guest star uh, in 1937, and this is a, ra a different time. Uh, this was one of the mo most popular shows on radio, and it starred a ventriloquist. Now think, of, think about this. Uh, you could be a pretty good ventriloquist on radio. They'd never see your mouth move. Um, you could just tell them you were drinking water while uh, uh, talking. Who would know the difference? Um, anyway, the uh, uh, ventriloquist became a, or the uh, dummy became a huge star. His name was Charlie McCarthy. And uh, um, uh, this is a very small chunk of a scene uh, that uh, the wooden doll is doing with uh, uh, Mae West. And I'll tell you ahead of time that when this played, you'd have sworn that all the children were going to be sold into uh, uh, prostitution and bondage as a result of uh, uh, what you're about to uh, hear. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm not pushing any buttons before I've gone through them. <laughs> and then here's my, there we go. You ain't afraid I'll do you wrong. Well, now that you ask, I... Oh, uh... you're afraid I'll do you right. Well, I'm slightly confused. I need time for that one, May. <laughs> That's all right. I like a man what takes his time. <laughs> Why don't you come up uh, home with me now, honey? I'll let you plan my wood pile. <laughs> well... I'm not feeling very well tonight. I've been so nervous lately. I think I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. Wait, there I go. So, good time Charlie's going to play hard to get. Well, you can't kid me. You're afraid of women. Your Casanova stuff is just a front. A false front. It's not so loud, May. Not so loud. All my girlfriends are listening. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're all wood in the yard long. Yeah. You weren't so nervous and backward when you came up to see me in my apartment. In fact, you did, didn't need any encouragement to kiss me. Did I do that? Oh, you yes. certainly did. I got marks to prove it. Oh. And splitters, too. Oh, well, that's too much. This is too much. Now, of course, that's not too shocking by today's standards, but that was kind of sophisticated uh, uh, humor. They also did an Adam and Eve sketch, and it had a little bit of the Cole Porter kind of uh, thing. Well, anyway, the uh, uh, Catholic League of Decency, which uh, you ever see a Saturday Night Live uh, church lady? Think of the Catholic League of Decency as an army of uh, uh, those uh, uh, church ladies. They complained uh, to everybody they could find, calling this particular sketch, and I'm quoting now, propaganda in support of sex delinquency and moral perversion. That little uh, uh, bit. Um, and that could play in my wood pile. That was the dirtiest part, and I can't even quite figure out how that's dirty. It just, like I said, she makes uh, anything um, sounds dirty. Uh, uh, anyway, the newly named FCC, this is 37, the FCC uh, was, name was changed in 34, I think. Uh, they investigated, and they in fact gave a little sanction. There was no whatever, but it went into their, their file uh, for license renewal. Um, and NBC defended themselves. They said it was all about the delivery. Here, read the transcript. Uh, um, uh, and they defended themselves. So there was no real uh, consequences uh, uh, legally. But Mae West was in fact banned from from NBC from then on. She was never hired. They asked people not even to mention her name. She wasn't mentioned the next week on the uh, Chase and uh, uh, Sanborn Hour. And this is 37. She didn't get to come back to radio until 1950. She was persona non um, grata. She was essentially banned from radio and a certain style of comedy and somewhat adult humor was banned uh, uh, along with it. It is amazing how we have taken this embarrassment. We're a, t a country both obsessed with sex and embarrassed by it. And we brought this over back in 1620. Uh, 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 um, and it has totally stifled the uh, and had a medium remain in arrested development, constantly infantilized because of the fear of talking about uh, uh, excretory and sexual kinds of things. Now, most people think, and we'll get to uh, that, uh, this gets to the indecency rule. But I think broadcasters have been infant infantilized, namely because, for one thing, they were always afraid of uh, uh, not only um, uh, regulations that uh, existed, and of course, you did have to get your 
your license renewed uh, uh, by the FCC. But they were also scared to death about regulations that didn't exist. Think of the movies. The movies had no, uh, FCC had no jurisdiction over the movies. It was the mid-60s before you started hearing swearing on any regular basis in the movie, and certainly before you started seeing uh, nudity and uh, graphic sex, except in um, specialized uh, uh, sorts of films. It's why you had of all those pictures where women would and men would embrace, and the next scene would be a train going through a tunnel, or a next, uh, the next thing would be um, uh, waves splashing on the beach. Matter of fact, I'm convinced our embarrassment about sex uh, has caused millions of people to die of cancer. How would that possibly be? Well, when you can't show people having sex, you got to show them doing sexy stuff. And one of those was smoking cigarettes together. That was the way you kind of said, it was coded language. If you ever saw Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall um, smoke a cigarette together, it's a pretty hot uh, 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 process. Um, and that, for decades after decades after decades, associated smoking with cool and turned on and all of that sort of stuff, I'm totally convinced that uh, uh, even to this day, the cultural air that cigarette smoking has is still left over from the decades it had to serve as the surrogate for sexual intercourse. But that's kind of a digression. Um, uh, anyway, so movies were worried about uh, 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 potential uh, um, uh, Regulation. So they started the Hayes Code, which had these incredibly strict sorts of things that were not legal. They were within the industry uh, uh, itself. Um, TV also had to worry about uh, 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 similar things, uh, and they had their own code, the NAB Code, which not only didn't let you, it was things like, of course, there could be no sex or swearing. You couldn't show a woman's belly button. Uh, you couldn't show anyone practicing voodoo. I don't know what that one was about. Maybe because they thought it would go, you know, people could actually use the TV to, you know, kill their friends or whatever. All kinds of really peculiar stuff. And then they also had the worry of uh, uh, advertisers, sponsors, and sponsors, of course, didn't want to offend anybody. So we get this medium, the greatest medium uh, for distribution of popular uh, uh, entertainment and information of all time, and it goes nowhere. Where television was, uh, where broadcasting was in 1937, uh, with regards to swearing, sex, and that kind of stuff, virtually doesn't change until about 1971, which means the evolution of content of television is static from the early days of radio to 1971. It doesn't allow itself to evolve the way the novel did and poetry did and music did um, to reflect the changing ways people are thinking. And quite a few things happened between 1937 and 1971. Oh, I don't know, uh, the Second World War, a global uh, economic uh, depression, the Vietnam War, a Cold War, uh, the invention of the birth control pill combined with uh, effective penicillin leading to the uh, uh, sexual revolution, all of this stuff changes, and television goes absolutely nowhere. Radio, radio and first uh, um, uh, television go absolutely nowhere. That begins to change in 1971 with a show like All in the Family, which got people uh, all upset, so they came up with the idea of the family hour, which was ultimately struck down by the uh, uh, courts. You can read about that um, uh, if you're interested. And then we got into the 1970s, and radio started to really um, uh, begin to uh, play stuff television still didn't, stayed under their own uh, uh, standards of practices. And throughout that period, we're talking about uh, one of the biggest hits of all time was I Love Lucy in the 1950s. CBS, their own standards and practices. It wasn't the government. It wasn't uh, uh, even the uh, uh, trade code. CBS's own standard, standards and practices forbade the word pregnant to be uttered the entire uh, season in which she was pregnant. In her most highest rated episode of all time where she has her baby, she's not in the, the, uh, uh, the last two thirds of the episode. When her time comes, she disappears into the magic land, and it may, it may as well be a cabbage patch or a, a stork landing uh, uh, zone, and uh, uh, she never comes back. The whole drama is about how much pressure it is on the father to have a baby. And if, uh, you, you know, uh, not being able to show sex uh, uh, caused millions to die of, uh, of lung cancer, 
I have got to think that kind of presentation has got to have messed a lot of people uh, um, uh, up. Uh, I grew up, forget no premarital sex on television. There was no marital sex on television. It was still the, the two beds on uh, 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 each side. It was a weird um, uh, fantasy world. Well, in the 60s and 70s, that begins to change. We'll talk about jo jo um, George Carlin um, uh, in a second. But let's... Um, uh, I think this is what I'm doing next. Let's now go uh, jump back up to the 20th century and one of the no notorious things that happened that started putting some action into the legal dimension of this subject matter. Yeah. I turned it off? There's no volume on that. And the winner is... Oh. Is, is, is someone controlling uh, the gain on this? Because I'm, I'm cranked up as far as I can. I uh, will live with it. Told you, boys. The hands of Build America, Gangs of New York, music and lyrics, you too. That's really, really fucking brilliant. And... Uh, <laughs> Really, really great. And, you know, there's a lot of songs in, in, in films and some great songs and a couple of U2 songs, but not often are the songs come out of the characters. Now, you would think, um, and you guys have to read all these, you read these cases and you learn how to read uh, 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 law cases and you put that all into context. You have to realize that to civilians like me, when we read these cases of how these decisions makes, how incredibly disconnected from actual cultural life, it, uh, uh, it seems to be. And I think it goes back to the League of Decency, who had standards so much higher than the average person's standards, which they then imposed onto fear, feared uh, broadcaster. Anyway, at first the FCC said that this was not indecent. Um, they, and by the way, anybody who wants to correct me, I would be happy to be corrected by the likes of you guys um, on any of this stuff. Uh, uh, they said that um, uh, it was not indecent. And in September uh, 2003, the FCC said, I'm quoting, the word may be crude and offensive, uh, but in the context presented here, did not describe sexual or excretory organs or activities. And this is how we were interpreting uh, the Pacifica case and even some stuff uh, before that back then, that okay, it's indecent if it uh, uh, reaches a certain standard of offensiveness uh, with regards to uh, sexual or excretory. Again, you might think about how did a culture decide in the one thing it's going to kind of cordon off? Uh, uh, do we have it be you know racist talk? Do we have it be stuff about violence? No, how about sex and poo-poo and, and pee-pee, as I keep uh, 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 talking about. Anyway, I think the best essay on this came actually, this Bono thing was what, 2000 or the, two, three, two years earlier in uh, 2001, uh, South Park did an episode, and it was a parody of previous, two years previous to that in 99, Chicago Hope had announced that it was going to say the S word for the first time in a scripted television show, and it did, and uh, we were supposed to all be so excited. Um, and nobody made a peep. I don't know how many complaints they got, but there was no uh, uh, cases, no fines, uh, no anything. So to make fun of this, South Park does, does a uh, episode, and um, the, the one kid's got tickets to the Lion King, which would be like having tickets to Hamilton today. He's all excited. Nobody wants to go with him, though because he just, uh, they just found out that they're going to say uh, the S word on, uh, on cop drama tonight and uh, uh, whatever. Anyway, they say it and everybody does what the League of Decency is always afraid they're going to do. Everybody just starts saying that word all the time and it, all the TV shows do it. By the way, after 1999, we didn't hear that S word again on a scripted television drama for like 10 years. Um, anyway, so this is the uh, time where, where teachers are now having to deal with this. So they're explaining to their kids when and when they can't use the S word. Now remember, indecency is defined by sexual or excretory. So they're going to explain when we can't say the X, S word, just like that we did with Bono and the uh, uh, F word. I hope we get v better volume with this because this kind of stuff ought to be cranked. <laughs> A 
right, children, in lieu of the common usage, I'm supposed to clarify the school's position on the word shit. Wow, we can say shit in school now? Oh, this is ridiculous. Just because they say it on TV, it's all right? Yes, but only in the figurative noun form or the adjective form. Eh? You can only use it in the non-literal sense. For instance, that's a shitty picture of me is now fine. <laughs> However, the literal noun form of this is a picture of shit is still naughty. I don't get it. Me neither. The adjective form is now also acceptable. For example, the weather outside is shitty. However, the literal adjective is not appropriate. For example, my bad diarrhea made the inside of the toilet bowl shitty, and I had to clean it with a rag, which then also became shitty. That's right out. <laughs> Shit. Very good, Timmy. Uh, Miss Chokes on Dick, uh, can we say it in the expletive? Like, oh shit, or shit on a shingle? Yes, that's now fine. Wow, this is gonna be great. A whole new word. It's not new. I'm gonna look shit up in the encyclopedia and prove it. Don't mind Kyle, everyone. He's just got a little sand in his vagina. There's no sand in my vagina! Boys, watch your language! Shit! And so, children, instead of saying hand in your papers, I may now say hand in your shit. Any questions? What about I have to take a shit? No, no, Fillmore. You can say I have to poop and shit, or oh shit, I have to poop, but not I have to shit. Are we all clear? No. Look, it's all about context. Now, doesn't that sound, you've read these cases, that's pretty, that's pretty legal talk, isn't it? That it's all about context. I think that comes right out of uh, um, uh, one of these uh, decisions. And that was what they said about Bono the first time. It was a, uh, an adjectival thing of celebration. It had absolutely no nothing to do with the uh, uh, act, um, uh, sexual act. Uh, but that's... Uh, well, well, we'll get to what happens then. Let's go briefly back to the um, Pacifica case. I think you guys all know this, right? 1978, the old story. It, it, it's almost like uh, these kind of things you tell around the grand uh, uh, children fire, campfire kind of thing. Uh, there once was a, you know, a boy driving to work, or a man driving to work with his little boy in 1973, and on came this George Carlin thing, and it so traumatized his blah, 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 and hence we got the Pacifica case. You always hear clips about the seven dirty words thing, and half the time, all you ever hear is the part about the seven dirty words where he says them in succession. And most of the time I hear this story being discussed, someone is playing a clip from a different performance than uh, the one that uh, was actually the case here. This is from... Uh, an album called Occupation Fool that had just come out in 73. And uh, in October, October 30th, 1973 is when this guy uh, heard it on the New York uh, Pacifica station. And that's what uh, started the whole process. I find it a really delightful symmetry that on October, that was October 30th, 1973, exactly 35 years before the War of the Worlds played, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds on October 30th, 1938. So we have this 35 year of separation of crazy people going really cr crazy over stuff they hear on the radio when they should never have, uh, 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 when it shouldn't really have upset them that much. It's like, um, well, never mind. Uh, anyway, again, I think this was at low volume, so I hope you can even hear it because this thing is set really, really low. I haven't pushed it, so it's not that bad. Oh, this is just the, um... Anyway, enough of that. Yeah, this is just the F word part. This is a long thing. By the way, the whole transcript is connected to Pacifica. I've read that entire case and the transcript of the entire, uh, probably 12 minute long uh, thing. And uh, this is where he talks about the F word. Once again, listen to how legal it kind of sounds. I mean, he's really doing a deconstruction with a bunch of stupid jokes that aren't very funny uh, uh, by today's standards. But there is a sense of, of doing this, but it asks us a totally different question than what uh, the indecency definition is. <laughs> the big one, the word fuck, that's the one that hangs them up the most. Because in a lot of cases, that's the very act that hangs them up the most. So it's natural that the word would uh, have the same effect. It's a great word, fuck, nice word, easy word, cute word, kind of. Easy word to say, one syllable, short U. Fuck, boom, you know, it's easy. Starts with a nice soft sound, <laughs> Ends with a <laughs> right? Little something for everyone, fuck. <laughs> Good word, kind of a proud word, too. Who are you? I am fuck.
Fuck of the Mountain. <laughs> Tune in again next week to Fuck of the Mountain. It's an interesting word too because it's got a double kind of a life, personality, dual, you know, whatever the, the right phrase is, it leads a double life, the word fuck. First of all, it means sometimes, most of the time, fuck. What does it mean? It means to make love. Right? We're gonna make love, eh? We're gonna fuck. We're gonna fuck. We're gonna make love. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna fuck. We're gonna make love, right? And it also means the beginning of life. It's the act that begins life. So there's the word hanging around with words like love and life. And yet, on the other hand, it's also a word that we really use to hurt each other with, man. It's a heavy. It's one that you save toward the end of the argument, right? <laughs> so you finally can't make. Ah, oh, fuck you, man! It's a fuck. Now, that also had kind of an academic, legal-like uh, thing, but in a weird way, it's almost as though George Carlin, his act in the appendix of that decision made more sense than what we were reading in the decision itself. Because think about it. Okay, it's bad and you can get fined if you say the F word in a sexual context, meaning what it originally meant. But as Carlin points out, that's actually the nice part of that word. That's when it means love and life, as he, I think, very aptly pointed out. And think about it, when, when that word gets used, if that word is ever used by you or toward you in a sexual, uh, uh, with a sexual meaning, it's often, you know, in a erotic or turned on or whatever kind of way. That's, a, that's the, nice, uh, uh, the nice thing. Whereas when it's not in a sexual context, that's when uh, um, you know, you're being violent and aggressive and all of that. Uh, when you say go F yourself to someone, that how could that be a sexual con uh, context? It, it would be impossible uh, uh, anatomically. Um, yet, yet the indecency rules are completely reversed there. What's indecent is uh, uh, the one, the, the first meeting, and what's not is all of the vulgar stuff that uh, 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 gathered, um, uh, gathered around that. Well, I guess they were um, uh, paying attention to that because uh, that first uh, FCC saying Bono's F word is okay uh, was in uh, September of 03. In uh, end of February of 04, the FCC reverses itself. So that's the same calendar or the same you know, uh, academic year anyway. What is the, uh, what's the deal with that? Why suddenly that? And then also they said, I think I've got this straight, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that fleeting expletives are also subject to um, punishment. Um, and then they also said that uh, 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 Bono's F word uh, and other words don't need to be excretory or, or uh, sexual anymore, that they, they can potentially be uh, fined other ways. So what, why did this change so quickly? Well, we all remember what we were doing in great moments of, of television, uh, uh, when television covered uh, events. There was, of course, if you're of a certain age, uh, the JFK assassination in 63, of another generation, the explosion of the Challenger in 86, and of course, for all of us, uh, um, uh, September 11th. But between Bono, it's okay, and Bono, no, it's not okay, and fleeting expletives, whatever, fleeting expletives, not okay, uh, something really important happened, and this is what what it was. That's so far so good. She mentioned a bunch of bad things and said no to each other. Come on and dance with me. You don't have to revolt. Come on and play. Come on and dance with me. 
penny. Choose to be different. Choose to be independent. Choose, Choose, to, Choose to pursue your dreams. Your dreams. Thank you for watching the AOL no, they Top never Game Super the Bowl 38 Halftime Show. And remember, the party continues later on AOL.com and Superbowl.com. Well, once again, you would have swore that... Uh, uh, that Herod had come back to murder the innocents. Um, it, it was this cry of the children, you know, like like oh the humanity kind of a thing. I don't think any child got hurt by that broadcast, short of the kids whose dads got fired because of that broadcast. Uh, um, uh, uh, happening. Most kids would have not have seen it. I watched the Super Bowl stone cold sober with a clipboard because I have to, that's my job. Uh, and I missed it. I must have been taking a note or something. But the next day, I was uh, told of it. My phone started ringing at 5.15 and of my entire career, I did more interviews that day than any time in my 34, 35 year career. 86 interviews because for less than a half a second, less than a quarter of a second, from 50 yards, uh, Janet Jackson's nipple was exposed and what was this going to do to the children? And by the way, let's remember the Pacifica case is about who? Most of it? The children. It's, but that whole 10 o'clock to 6 or 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock isn't arbitrary. It's when the children are awake. I don't know what world the kids are all in bed at 10, but again, whatever. Uh, so uh, uh, we are uh, now in the middle of a war, a pretty bad war. This is 2004. This is a presidential election uh, year and kind of an important and uncertain one um, uh, as well. And uh, we managed to ha managed to get federal hearings on these on this in nine days. The, the the Capitol could be burning down, and you couldn't get the fire department called in nine days. And nine day days we had uh, 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 things. And I want to just show one clip. It's pretty typical of the whole thing. Uh, it's uh, uh, one representative, and she's almost weeping. She's going. I should not have to use the Super Bowl as an example of negative behavior to my children. And it's like, like this has been the most horrible thing that's ever happened to this. I don't know. She must have had a pretty good uh, life. And then Mel Karmazin, the head of uh, CBS, is just completely taking it. I mean, they, they just shut up, which is one of the whole reasons the situation has been this way uh, for the history of the, um, uh, uh, of the medium. So we'll just uh, uh, play a little clip of that. I think it's hysterical if we could hear it. Um, and then the other uh, uh, thing was that nobody said a word about, OK, if it's all about the children, and at the Super Bowl is this, uh, you know, you get the kids in the jammies, you read them Twas the Night Before Christmas, and then you watch the Super Bowl. If you looked at the ads that year, they were filled with all kinds of excretory stuff, a lot of farting that uh, year. And not one, but two erectile dysfunction products, Cialis and, uh, um, uh, and Viagra. So if you're really worried about how this ruined the family experience that they're all gathered around, I would think probably the, what's Viagra for, daddy? Why are those two people in two bathtubs outside, uh, daddy? Uh, was probably a more uncomfortable situation uh, uh, than the other. So here's a little bit of this, um, of those issues. <clears throat> Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for continuing to pursue this issue and for your leadership on this issue. On Super Bowl weekend, I was out of town visiting my mom, and I called home a few minutes before halftime. And in our house, we're real restrictive about television watching, but we have a, we have a sports fanatic fourth grader who asked for special permission to watch the game. So my husband and my kids together watched the Super Bowl. And even before halftime, I heard about the farting horses, which I guess proves what we've all suspected, that Madison Avenue really does pitch its advertising to the average fourth grader's sense of humor. 
When I called the next day, my son, without any prompting, said to me, Mom, did you see the halftime show at the Super Bowl? And I told him that I had. And I asked him what he thought of it. And he said, I thought it was nasty. The disrobing was apparently the talk of the playground in our neighborhood for the whole following day. And the kids on the playground seemed to know that the television station might get sued, which is really not a bad fourth grade description of an FCC fine. My son seemed to think that they should sue Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake because they were the ones who did it and it was really nasty. If the fourth grade boys at a public elementary school in Albuquerque, New Mexico can tell right from wrong, we need to ask ourselves where you corporate CEOs lost your way. <laughs> Breaking up. It's too much for her. I should not have to use an NFL halftime show as a negative example to teach my children. And there are a lot of other parents who feel the same way. As a lawmaker, I want to know how something like this made it on to the show in a very scripted, rehearsed for weeks performance. And all of these, well, we never knew about it, sounds a little like the Homer Simpson defense. <laughs> the playground at our elementary school should have been a buzz with talk of the Patriots and their great moves on the field. Oh yeah, a buzz with the great NFL, the family Not the values. Moves of some place. disrobing rock star. The FCC plays an important role in protecting Americans and our children from indecent programming. The FCC has a statutory mandate to prohibit indecency on broadcast, but the government alone is not the answer. While some argue that television and radio reflect social values, you also influence social values. And in the same way that Enron highlighted unacceptable corporate <laughs> behavior from a financial point of view and ethics in our corporate boardrooms, Viacom's support of shock jocks and allowing tasteless Super Bowl programming is a nationwide entertainment industry scandal. You knew what you were doing. You knew what kind of entertainment you're selling. And you wanted us all to be a buzz here in this room and on the playground in my kids' school because it improves your ratings, it improves your market share, and it lines your pockets. It's time for a change. And unless we see change in the corporate boardrooms and a return to responsibility, this bill is only going to be the first step in changing American broadcasting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Davis. That's my favorite part. You know, that, that sort of, you know, uh, tick-tock, Heather, I got, I got a date sort of thing. Um, uh, but anyway, if you break down that argument, it's one of the most disturbingly bizarre uh, sorts of thing. First of all, she complains about how Madison Avenue is completely going uh, after the fourth grade, uh, uh, the fourth grader mentality, which is not wrong. That is not the prime demographic of Madison Avenue. Uh, they do farting horse jokes because 18 to 25 year old like farting horse jokes. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, But then she goes on to frame her whole argument. She lets her son frame it. Oh, he came home and he said they should be sued and he said this and that. She lets her fourth grader kind of frame uh, her whole Whole argument. That whole bit about uh, you did this for ratings. Two things wrong with that. Number one, if you're doing it for ratings, you have to advertise that you're going to do it because that's going to, it's too late once it's happened. And there was no, uh, YouTube didn't even exist yet. Uh, so you were, uh, uh, these things were going online, but they weren't. Um, 
certainly weren't distributed later. Uh, and the other thing uh, is that the one time you wouldn't have to do this for ratings would be the Super Bowl. It's the one time they're already guaranteed. And then she mentions, and this is a law class, maybe you can answer this for me. What is the Homer Simpson defense? Does anybody know? I have no idea what she's talking. You know what that is? Oh, okay. I guess that would be a pretty good defense, which is, okay, okay that's probably is what she's talking about. Hmm, I like her a little better now. Um, uh, I forget what's on here. Oh, yeah, one more thing about this. Bob, let me just, let me hear you on the subject of the commercials. Uh, and I mean, some of the bathroom humor, most of the bathroom humor yesterday was in the commercials. Commercials are designed by people who are trying to sell a product. They wouldn't put it out there if they didn't think people were, A, watching it, and B, were going to be influenced by it. Are they just totally wrong? Well, I think uh, th this idea that somehow bathroom humor has assaulted this great American institution of the Super Bowl, Super Bowl parties have been filled with belching, people half in the bag, falling off their lazy <laughs> chairs. This idea that somehow the Super Bowl is this Thanksgiving with the pilgrims around, uh, I don't know where that came from. Super Bowl has been a kind of raunchy place, the first holiday in which you can break all the New Year's resolutions. It came, from, it came from the NFL promotion department. Where do you that's, think it came from? That, that's precisely where it came from. So sure it's raunchy, sure it's bathroom humor, filled with scatology, football, beer, scatology. This has been a match uh, made long before we had this conversation. So when this uh, thing happens in the halftime show, everybody is somehow shocked that this has assaulted this uh, uh, institution. It was completely consistent with the kinds of things we've been seeing in the ads and in the attitude of, uh, uh, of football in this culture for a good long time. I thank you all, gentlemen. Uh, it, it was good to have you with us. Frank Rich, Robert Thompson, Cal Thomas. That guy on I'll the left back is... Uh, in a moment. Crazy. Um, I would always find, when I was in the green room, with a, a lot of these people, with these family values people, and by the way, if the, if the organization has the word American family values in some co combination thereof, tread, tread lightly, as Walter White would say. Um, anyway, I'd be in the green room with these guys, and I'd be g going out there uh, saying that uh, hearing a naughty word is not going to kill the children. Uh, and these guys would be making the exact, the, the Heather Wilson uh, sort of uh, uh, argument. Uh, and then you'd go into the gr a green room afterwards, and they'd be talking like sailors. And I'm still, I, I'm convinced I'm the only American left uh, adult in this country. When I stub my toe in the middle of the night, I still say, ouch. I was not allowed to use that language as a kid, and by the time I left the house, I hadn't gotten into the uh, um, habit. So I, it's not like I'm here defending that, oh, we need more naked people and uh, running around swearing with their pants off uh, on TV. Um, but think about when the cable revolution starts to happen. Think about what television does now on shows like The Sopranos or did uh, The Wire, Fargo, and all the rest of it. When you didn't have to say, uh, oh, darn it, I'm going to hit you upside the head even though you're a uh, mobster kind of thing. Anyway, you heard me talking there. Nobody listened to me because uh, uh, what happens is the Bono, uh, uh, that was the, the uh, uh, evening after the Super Bowl thing, the Bono decision, the FCC uh, uh, flip-flops on, and then um, uh, Cher, who had gone to the uh, Billboard, Billboard Awards on Fox in 2002, and Nicole Ritchie, who had uh, gone to the same Billboard uh, Awards on Fox, uh, um, uh, get uh, uh, now... Um, retroactively the decision is made to get fined right that comes after right after that and on top of that a uh, episode from 2003 of NYPD Blue NYPD Blue was one of the first and to this day only show that really treaded into some relatively uh, uh, more advanced uh, uh, naked bodies and language and even today if you watch Empire and some of those hot shows scandal um, it's more so than we saw uh, uh, um, uh, 10 years ago but it's actually none of it has gone as far as NYPD Blue as broadcast uh, television. So here, if, as long as I'm showing the greatest hits of the 21st century uh, uh, naughtiness, here's Cher and uh, Nicole Ritchie. This played on Fox, but these are the um, rebroadcasts that C-SPAN did during some hearings. And then the scene from NYPD Blue, which is really actually quite a cute little... Uh, um, scene. It's kind of a ripoff of a Kramer versus Kramer uh, scene, but a, uh, uh, a, a man has a son who's living with him, and a woman, his, his, they, his, uh, his mother, is, they've been separated, so he's living with a new woman, and the son is trying to get used to 
life with uh, uh, th this other person, uh, not his mother in the house. And uh, in this scene, it's the most awkward way that can sometimes happen. He walks into uh, the bathroom when she's just getting um, out of the shower. But notice how the whole thing is uh, uh, shot. First of all, she becomes uh, shocked. You're, you're seeing it through the kid's uh, viewpoint. And then she has this very modest, anyone ever seen Botticelli's Venus, uh, uh, the birth of Venus as she comes out of the, uh, uh, of the water and she's doing this almost Adam and Eve-like um, uh, 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 sort of thing. Uh, as though the kid is God who has just told her she's been banned and now she has to be embarrassed about her uh, nakedness. In an odd way, NYPD Blue's scenes almost seem to be self-conscious of their own fact that they were breaking the rules, where this woman has to immediately go, ooh, not just because the little kid is there, but because some clown from uh, standards and practices is going to be uh, 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 breathing down. And uh, uh, they did. They got in a lot of trouble for this fine. It was later, uh, whatever you call when you say never mind to the fine, but uh, um, uh, there was a substantial fine uh, given to this. I've had unbelievable support in my life, and I've worked really hard. I've had great people to work with, and, oh, you know what? <laughs> I've also had critics for the last 40 years saying that I was on my way out every year. Right. So fuck them. I don't know if that's sexual or not. That could go either way. The sexual one being the top forty mainstream out. track. Here are two babes whose lives are anything but mainstream. From their hit TV series, The Simple Life. Please welcome Nicole Richie and Ares Hilton. <laughs> Remember, this is a live show. Watch the bad language. Okay. God. <laughs> it feels so good to be standing here tonight. Yeah, instead of standing in mud and cow shit. Why do they even call it the simple life? Have you ever tried to get cow shit out of a Prada purse? It's not so fucking simple. <laughs> But that was a nice touch. <sighs> Sorry. It's okay. No problem. Now, what's interesting about that in a lot of ways, too, if you think of what we've already been... Uh, what we've already been uh, talking about is... Um, first of all, there, there is that. Uh, NYPD Blue was done by a multi-Peabody award-winning, multi-Emmy award-winning uh, person. It was a really classy show. This is before uh, Sopranos, before the big HBO revolution. This was network television teaching cable how it was ultimately going to do adult programming like, uh, uh, like this. Many stations, when they heard there was nudity in the very beginning, refused to play the show, including here in Syracuse, New York. Uh, we had some, and I, I, I'm sorry, but I think it was a spineless uh, decision because you're supposed to. It's, as, a, as a station manager, if you think something is not in the best interest of your community, uh, you're supposed to serve the, pub, the interest of your community and make those decisions. So that would have been fine. Okay, I think that I, I would disagree with him, but if he thought that this bad language or whatever shouldn't be going into living rooms, he wouldn't be the first to think that. But what did he replace it with? 
real life stories of the highway patrol. So here's how the public interest was perceived by uh, uh, our station manager uh, who was using our airwaves uh, uh, over Channel 9, was that he was going to take away Emmy Award winning program and give us real life stories uh, of the highway patrol, which was a crummy low budget um, uh, reality show uh, at the time. But, okay, even then, if he really thought it wasn't in our interest to see this stuff, then fine. The show becomes an enormous hit. The ratings uh, go through the ceiling. It becomes what could be the most profitable show for him uh, at his ABC affiliate. So four, uh, four episodes in, quietly it appears. Uh, it hadn't like they took the nudity away or they did anything like that. Uh, he realized that I simply can't afford to serve the public interest. I, I made my point by uh, leaving it off for, uh, 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 for, four, um, uh, for four episodes, but public interest all season, I, I, we can't do that. Um, he didn't last very long, but, uh, and uh, got a lot of grief, including from me, over, uh, uh, over that. Uh, anyway, I think, I think these are things we ought to think. We so take how the relationship between our airwaves and how they are, they are managed for us and the relationship between um, uh, ideas like obscenity and uh, uh, um, well, profanity and indecency and all the rest of it. And now, after we've had that latest decision, which kind of really throws this up in the air where the court says, well, if you're going to get fine people for this stuff, you better define what it is and uh, uh, let us know how that goes and uh, you know, get back to us. This is basically what the decision is, not really. Anyway, so now there's this opening where uh, people could rethink some of this stuff. Not to mention now that nobody makes this distinction between broadcast television and the rest when they're watching it, only when it's, uh, um, uh, uh, when it's being made. We, um, in the Victorian era, used to actually put skirts. You may have grandparents that still have this in their house. Skirts over the legs of... Uh, chairs, those little shims, it was because legs had that kind of leg look in chairs back then, and they thought that to have them bare would somehow turn us on and make us go do bad, uh, 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 bad things. Um, and there's an odd way in which, as I read the legal stuff of these uh, uh, kinds of issues, where so much of it you think, is this really a civil, did, did, this, did this nation actually go to the moon? Uh, I'm sure they had pants on when they went up there, I guess, because, geez. Anyway, I'm going to end with uh, uh, two clips that make me very, very sad. And that is this bare bottom. Oh, and one more thing. This is why I think they're so self-conscious of what they're doing. She covered up the two actual sexual parts of the body. But all we see, but she got fined for the one thing that I think they didn't think they would that was safe, which is the, 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 uh, uh, the buttocks. Because technically, that's not excretory. You'd have to get pretty close to make that excretory. And it's not really sexual uh, unless the FCC uh, uh, are into that kind of thing. But um, I think there was a real choice to use that part of the body to do this, and also a very conscious shout out when she covered the other two uh, uh, parts uh, in, in almost uh, in, in almost ridiculously over the top uh, um, uh, church lady kind of uh, uh, fashion. So uh, artists were beginning to play off of this kind of thing. Anyway, that fine happens for an episode that played in uh, uh, two thousand. Three, 2003, I think. Um, way before this, there had been scripted TV with planned naked buttocks. In 1987, a show called St. Elsewhere, I still think one of the best shows uh, ever made, had a, uh, uh, a guy who had been working for the hospital forever, kept being betrayed by his boss, finally gets enough and gives him a full moon at the end of the uh, episode. And they freeze frame on it for the, for the, uh, uh, for the credits. Um, uh, He's probably in his uh, mid-50s. And then NYPD Blue, eight seasons before the one we just saw that had all the fine and no fine and fine and no fine, um, had an episode in which uh, one of its characters, Andy Sipowitz, takes a shower uh, and we see his butt. And he's probably mid-40s uh, uh, at that time. And as an uh, old guy in my mid-50s, I don't know quite how to take this. So what? We, we find the, the women because they're hotter, and the, the men's butts are so unappealing that they don't even deserve indecency uh, uh, kind of thing. Who would even want to look at something uh, uh, like that? We don't have to worry about the children. They'll be turning away. Um, 
And there, there's, I think, in, in, built in there some weird sexism, which is kind of saying, okay, we know women are sexual objects, so we're going to uh, act according to that, uh, uh, that knowledge. Uh, and, the, you know, these men, they got jobs and whatever are going to be a different uh, uh, kind of thing. The St. Elsewhere thing you're not going to notice as much because it's, it's a, a little short thing, but the scene from NYPD Blue is such a beautiful scene. Andy Sipowitz is this racist alcoholic, troubled, angry, destructive uh, 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 guy. Um, and he's slowly beginning to learn to live in the civilized world. And this woman, uh, he's about to move in with this woman. Matter of fact, he's at her house uh, right now. Um, and he's becoming a human being. And uh, she obviously really loves him, and he's kind of converting. And listen to his dialogue. It's, it's practically non-language. She gives him a present, and it's a terry cloth uh, uh, towel. Uh, robe, and he goes, terry cloth, which I've never heard that word uttered in such beautiful context uh, before. Uh, and she wants to t take a shower with him. Anyway, it's a place for beautiful, a beautiful place to have actually naked butts in context that makes beautiful artistic uh, uh, sense. But I guess because he's an old guy, even she, who has a very young, much more fit uh, uh, body, um, her, her buttocks is, is exposed here as well. But his trumps hers, so ah, we won't bother with it. And neither of these episodes got any trouble uh, whatsoever. When it comes to culture and sexuality uh, in this country, we are so messed up. We, we are. This is such a bizarre uh, context. And we have to be thankful for cable, which is not in the um, uh, jurisdiction of the S FCC, that finally liberated the medium of television to do the wonderful, wonderful things it's been doing for the last uh, uh, 15, uh, 15 years. Donald, ever see one of these? Oh. One piece scalpel. Yeah. 18th century. Beautiful. I collect medical antiques. A nice touch. He thinks of him as a medical antique Donald, as well. This is no triumph for me, no cause for celebration. That's why you asked me to come here? Let me go to Collins and intercede on your behalf. The damage was massive, but not irreparable. I can get him to come around. I'm asking you, please. Sure. All right. Great. I will have to give you certain assurances, though, that, that you'll be less critical of our methods, that you'll work with me. I see. It's some kind of performance, isn't it? The good cop, the bad cop. You're just trying to get me to toe the line. Well, something like that. This hospital means a lot to you, and you to it. Help me make St. Allegis better. All that means is adapting your point of view, compromising a little. That's all. Yes. <laughs> what do you say? Well, it's a very interesting offer, John. Um, let me try to tell you in terms that I think you're going to understand. You can kiss my ass, pal. 1987, both language and image is... Uh... That was pretty brave. They also did the first AIDS-themed... Uh, show in like 80, AIDS gets named in 82, I think they're doing one by 84. I cleared out half the closet for you. I, I thought the, the official move wasn't until next week. Getting ready for it. I also cleared out some drawers. And I got you this. It's terry cloth. Thanks, Sylvia. It's for when you come out of your shower. Yeah, I guess maybe I better take one. You don't need to for me, Andy. No, I'll feel better. No? Okay. Oh, 
So how was work today? Uh, it was all right. I mean, uh, he was good on the case. So it's going better than you thought? Yeah, he's okay for now. What are you doing? I thought it'd be fun if we both took a shower. Two for the price of one. Uh, I usually shower alone. You want me to leave? No, I'm, I'm just saying as well. It's like minimalist right No, I'm just saying. Here. I'll wash your back. Wash myself down there. Do you want me to stop? Uh, no, not necessarily. Boy, that's sure gonna be clean. And that line shows how hmm. conscious they are that the game they have to play is being part of uh, uh, broadcast television. They had just struggled through a season and a half of people not, you know, uh, uh, affiliates not running their things, uh, being threatened with all of this kind of thing, and constantly being told, not by the League of Decency, which long since ceased to exist, but by the parents' television, or family television, parents' television council and all the rest, to clean up the show. And their little nod to that is, boy, is that ever going to be clean? And what do they do it? With a penis. The perfect way to, uh, 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 you know, kind of uh, uh, make an answer to uh, um, the Parents Television Council and the like. I will leave you with some proud uh, uh, Syracuse University um, information. Of the only few things that we watched today, uh, three of them were uh, uh, done by SU alums. Dick Clark uh, um, uh, Productions did the uh, Billboard or the Golden Globes, where Bono uh, says the F word, um, uh, and that scene and the other scene or the uh, scene from St. Elsewhere and the uh, other NYPD Blue were directed by Mark Tinker, a 1973 graduate of uh, uh, SU. So as I am here cheerleading the elimination of these things that aren't only old-fashioned rules. They never should have been fashioned rules uh, at all. Um, uh, I take pride that my fellow uh, uh, Orange alums have uh, uh, at least taken some direct steps in that direction as well. Again, I started this saying, uh, I don't know how it is that I ended up teaching, uh, uh, being invited to teach a law class. You now are probably asking that same question, so I apologize ahead of time. Ah, thank you.